in the early church, um, there was a series of different political leaders that were in control. You know, when Jesus was born, Herod the Great was the guy who tried to kill Jesus as a baby. Well, there's a series of Herods. In this chapter, we get a bad one. And this was a Herod who didn't like the Christians and wanted to get on side with the Jews and wanted to cause a whole heap of problems. And it does. Let us read Acts chapter 12. Now at that time, King Herod stretched out his hands to oppress some of the assembly. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. Peter therefore was kept in the prison, but constant prayer was made by the assembly to God for him. The same night when Herod was about to bring him out, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. Guards in front of the door kept the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up saying, stand up quickly. His chains fell off his hands and the angel said to him, get dressed and put on your sandals. He did so. He said to him, put on your cloak and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He didn't know that what was being done by the angel was real. He thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter had come to himself, he said, now I truly know that the Lord has sent out his angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from everything the Jewish people were expecting. Thinking about that, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, she didn't open the gate for joy, but she ran in and reported that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you're crazy. But she insisted that it was so. They said, it's just his angel. But Peter continued knocking. When they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But he beckoned to them with his hands to be silent and declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. He said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. When Herod had sought for him and didn't find him, he examined the guards and then commanded that they should be put to death. He went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They came with one accord to him and having made Blastus the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod dressed himself in royal clothing, sat on the throne and gave a speech. The people shouted, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. Then he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their service, also taking with them John, who was called Mark. All right, so um, we've got a new Herod in Jerusalem and he wants to have favor with the Jews, so he wants to persecute Christians. At this point, all the Christians are Jews. So it's a kind of a, in Jerusalem, all the Christians are Jews. So this is kind of like a Jew versus Jew situation between the Jews who love the Lord Jesus and the Jews who don't think that Jesus was not the Messiah. So Herod is the new political leader and he wants to find favor with the Jew Jews not with the Christian Jews. And so he kills James. So James is the brother of John, you know, James and John. And you might remember that there was a point in the gospels where James and John go to Jesus and say, can we sit at your right hand and at your left in the kingdom? And Jesus says, can you drink the cup that I'm gonna drink? And they say, sure, not knowing that it meant persecution. 
And Jesus says, you will indeed drink the cup. And James just drank the cup. So he is killed with the sword. It pleased the Jews, the Jewish Jews, and Herod realized it's pleased them. So he decides he's gonna kill Peter too. And of course, this puts the whole church into one big, long, extended prayer meeting. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't pray seriously for James, but I, I, they probably didn't think it was going to turn out that way. But once they saw what happened to James, the, the church is very concerned for Peter as they go to prayer. We'll get back to that in a minute. In the world today, you can travel to Spain and there's a cathedral, I think it's called uh, Compostelo Santiago, or it's maybe it's Santiago Compostelo. It's a, it's a, a, a cathedral and supposedly the body of James is buried there and you can go and pay a visit. I don't think it's the body of James. That's my personal opinion. Um, I have been to India and seen the body of St. Thomas. So, and you can go to the Vatican and you can see the body of St. Peter. Um, the thing about Peter in the Vatican is Peter was actually in Rome and was killed in Rome. So that's quite possible. The thing about Thomas is he was in India and was killed in India and that's quite possible too. But James was never in Spain. And um, so there's a whole discussion going on about did, how did James get to Spain? And he's the first of the apostles to be killed and he's killed in Jerusalem. So I suspect it's probably not James in Spain. <laughs> Still interesting tourist site if you happen to be there. And um, James is the first of the apostles to go to heaven. Now, when Judas died, he hanged himself. They replaced Judas. They said, you know, we need to keep the apostolate full, you know, and they replaced him with Matthias or Matthias. Um, but James dies and they don't replace him. And I've read, there's a bit of a discussion going on, what was the difference? Well, there's a very obvious difference. Very obvious difference is that Judas was a betrayer. He denied the Lord and he committed suicide. He was someone that um, was a disgrace to the, you know, to the office of the apostle, you could say. But James dies of natural causes. And um, apparently um, that was what was supposed to happen. And um, it doesn't mean that there were only 12 apostles. And uh, there, are, there are more than 12 apostles in the New Testament. There are in fact 25 uh, at least. And I think there's possibly a few others as well. So James dies, he does not get replaced unlike Judas and he's probably not buried in Spain. Um, but his death is enough to cause all the Christians of Jerusalem to realize, let's have a prayer meeting for Peter. And it says they prayed nonstop. They didn't stop praying for him. They get a roster and there's shifts and they, there's people praying for him all the time. And I think that that's the type of thing that Christians should do. Because what's happening is there's now, earlier, you know, there was persecution against Christians by Saul. Saul goes back to, uh, he leaves and he goes back to Tarsus. He's in Antioch and, he, you know, they're all up north. The persecution of that type stops, but now there's a different type of persecution. And this time it's against the leaders. And um, so the Christians pray and the Lord miraculously delivers Peter. And then the Lord ends the persecution by killing Herod. And they are the two miracles that are in this chapter. So Peter is miraculously delivered because he's in jail, guarded by 16 people, and an angel lets him out in the middle of the night. Now you might say, well, that's just a made up story. It's not a made up story because if it didn't happen, he'd be dead. <laughs> 16 guards, you know, they're watching him. I remember reading um, a book called Heavenly Man about Brother Yun, Brother Yun, Chinese guy, uh, who was being persecuted for being a Christian not that long ago, 20 or 30 years ago. He was in a prison in China. He did not have 16 guards, but he was in a cell. In the middle of the night, a man appears and says, follow me. And the man leads him out of the jail and says, there you go. And a taxi pulls up right at that point. He hops in the taxi and drives away and realizes later an angel helped him escape from prison. So it wasn't as dramatic as the story of Paul, but he was just led right out of the jail and went on his way. <laughs> it's happened. And uh, 
In the case of Peter, this is uh, obviously an angel. In the case of Brother Yuan, it, was, it just more was like a person. Go and read Heavenly Man, really interesting book. At times, the Lord does intervene for the sake of the elect, and especially when people are praying. So Paul then, of course, goes to the, to the house of uh, Mark, the, of Mary, the mother of Mark. This is John Mark who writes the Gospel of Mark. It's his house. They go to his house where the prayer meeting is happening. He tells them what's happened and says, I'm leaving town, which seems like the right thing to have done. As Christians, we're told by the Lord that if we are persecuted, to flee. This is the Lord's advice. He, he tells us to avoid persecution. Some Christians think that, that they, some, I've even heard Christians pray for persecution. I suggest you don't do that. <laughs> Their reason for praying for it is that, oh, whenever the church gets persecuted, then it really grows and we want the church to really grow. No. What happens is when the church is persecuted, the church prays. And it's when the church prays that the church grows. So don't pray for persecution. Pray for the church to grow. Pour your prayer into, pour your effort into praying, not your heart into wanting a persecution. That's my advice on the matter. The chapter finishes with Herod. There's some kind of political thing going on. Herod stands up and makes a speech and they start saying, the people of Tyre and Sidon up in Phoenicia, they start saying, these are the words of a God, not the words of a man. And Herod takes it to heart. All over the Roman world, uh, all the, over the ancient world, leaders were tempted by the idea of thinking that they were like a god of some type. You think of all the pharaohs, they often would say that they were a god. You know, Roman, in, even in Roman society, you know, Julius Caesar and all of these people thought they were like a god. And so Herod takes this to heart, thinking he's somehow more important, and then the Lord strikes him with, an angel touches him, it says, and he was eaten by worms. Now, you might, it sounds kind of instant, but that was, it was not an instant process. So at some point, his, his uh, Josephus describes it more interestingly, but his insides start to rot out with a terrible, it's, they waste away because he's got worms inside, parasites that start to eat him from the inside out. That, I don't think the, the early Christians prayed for that to happen but they were praying that the Lord would deliver them from persecution, and the Lord did. As Christians, we're told to love our enemies, so we don't pray harm on them, but sometimes the Lord delivers us in the most unusual ways, like what happened in Acts chapter 13. So I remember, um, I'll tell you this one little story, but it's about my son. Uh, he was jumping on the trampoline one day. He was just a young fellow, never forgotten this he was maybe six or five something like that and he was jumping on the trampoline and jumping as high as he could and he gets really high and he says i'm god and when he came down on the very next bounce his pants split right around the middle he got two legs and they're sewed around this way the seams went and split all the way around and i said to him i said never ever say you're god for some reason the lord takes that very seriously and um, God's kind, but it's almost like his way of saying, no, nah, not that. That's holy ground, you know, don't go there. And Herod in this chapter, he goes there. And as you can see, it didn't work out for him. So always keep your heart full of respect toward the Lord and never claiming any of his qualities or his, righteous, his rights as yours. But of course, he freely gives his righteousness and his gifts and blessings to us. So we can receive those with a lot of grace and gratitude. Lord, I wanna thank you for the way you deliver us as people. Thank you for delivering Peter. We wouldn't, we, it wouldn't the world wouldn't be the same if he hadn't been delivered. And uh, part of the Bible would be missing. And um, Lord, I just ask that your hand would be upon us to deliver us too from every scheme and every evil attack. In Jesus' name, amen.